What's up, world? I am Thunder Thief, and today we are talking about track five on my album Past Amore. This one's called Garage. <laughs> was sitting by a pool with my girlfriend and we had discovered this artist named Bella Boo and she's the sweetest Swedish artist that has really sick kind of down tempo house tracks and it's just perfect for like lounging and decompressing and um, I have very wonderful memories of Sweden when I played there in September of 2019 with April Henry, like that was such a wonderful experience and opportunity, and I can't wait to go back. And one of the things that Bella Boo did in a couple of her songs that I thought was pretty fantastic was she just had this bass drum pattern that just kept going the whole time and never really faltered from it. And the song just kind of built up and around it. And I knew that I wanted to make something kind of in that same vein. So I opened up my computer, you know. A month later when I'd gotten back and had some inspiration strike and I wrote this kick drum pattern. It's simple, but there's so many things that you can do around that. And I feel like I explore quite a bit of it throughout this song, which is essentially just drums building up and around that and flipping a little bit in the middle and the relationship the whole time is that's the kick drum and we're going to go around it. All of my guitar playing heroes have really killer melodies and riffs that some of them are really simple and some of them are a little more complex, but all of them can grab you in a way that doesn't feed into just that's a difficult guitar part. It's, more of a here's a collection of notes in a melody or sometimes a chord that strikes a chord within you. And I knew this song should wrap around a guitar part like that. And I was fiddling around and I ended up coming up with this kind of arpeggiated finger style riff. <laughs> And towards the second half of that riff, you can hear this slight pull off uh, of like a higher note that was an accident when I was recording. But then when, like, when I was looping it and listening back on it, I really loved how it sounded. And that's sometimes the magic of playing guitar too, is your fingers just move on the fretboard a little less mechanically and sometimes hit things that are surprising and wonderful. And the sound of it is something worth keeping. When I was first writing the bass intention with this song, I knew that I wanted something a little more simple and laid back, especially because that guitar part's so percussive and there's a lot of sort of staccato percussive stuff in the percussion as well that having a long sort of down tempo bass line was going to serve the song well. That's also one of my favorite ways to write against a guitar where it's like, here's a guitar arpeggio part and then I'll take the bass and figure out the root notes that really like connect the movement together. It's amazing what just changing the root note or the bass note of a progression can do to change the entire relationship of an arpeggio. And I knew that because this guitar part wasn't really that complicated or that crazy like amount of movement where I change chords quite a bit. I stay basically in the same handful of notes that what the bass did would really be the foundation of the progression and hearing the relationship between those chord changes. And I came up with this. And 
the last note of that loop stays on the second to last note of the first part of the progression. And I just liked the tension that it had and it pulled the riff into this sort of uncertain space, but it's like an uncertain, but relaxed type of energy. I like that so much. I wanted a guitar to just follow along with it and give this just sort of thick, low single string vibe on a guitar that is something I didn't appreciate nearly as much as I do now when I had first heard those kinds of riffs, but you hear like surf style music and there's a bunch of indie stuff that's like that where it's just like these guitar players are cranking on a single note or a single string and making it sound really interesting and aggressive and powerful without taking this corded instrument into account and really just playing it almost like a bass. So I just had the guitars follow the bass, but do something every now and again where instead of dropping down to the last note, it would uh, slide up. So you just had that slight differentiation enough to let you know that these are two different instruments. And I think that brings a really cool texture into the song once it comes in and differentiates between the bass, just give it that extra amount of attack and personality. Now that I had the root note movement, I started building chords to play along with the rest of the riff. And I was thinking ethereal and heavenly. And I popped open Diva and found this pad sound. And that's such a lazy but strong whale song type of tone. And it sat behind everything else really nicely. And what I started doing after listening back to it was like singing along, trying to do harmonies with vocals in an attempt to make this synthesized sound become more human. So there's a collection of my voice in this song that's doing some chord stuff and just making some random noises or a little yelling. I think I'd do something like a yup sort of thing. I get really inspired by vocalists and people who acknowledge all the weird noises that our mouth makes and trying to fold that in to their songs. And this felt like a good opportunity to sort of explore that within myself because I have this constant battle of should I put any sort of voice on here? And in this song, I thought it was pretty nice to have a human voice making some of the tones, but not necessarily singing any lyrics, just being there for texture. And then, of course, when you put the vocal synth on there and just start playing with how that sounds on top of your voice, it just gave it this really creepy, like, voice in your head or talking to you on your shoulder kind of moment. And I followed it up with just these, like, little breaths and these just, like, over exhalings because, I don't know, I get really overexcited about music stuff and even recording this podcast I'm like using way more energy in this conversation than I w ever would with a person in front of me and I wanted to portray like some kind of exertion along with this song and these breaths were the perfect little subtle nuance that I thought added that to it and I just also do these little ah uh, ah uh, and take breaths in between. And it just adds that little percussive element of the human voice. So this song feels innately human. Uh, 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 uh. 
one of the biggest challenges in making an instrumental record is there's not a lot of hooks to grab you. So you have to make a ton of melodies and things that someone can hear and interpret and then also vocalize. But because there's no vocals, it's got to be interpretable to retell someone be like, oh yeah, this melody that went like, no, 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 like whatever. If you can't recreate it by just voicing it, it's really hard to tell somebody about a song or something because you can't give them an example. So I was thinking about that with these synth melodies that I put in this song. And I basically just wrote these back to back, but I wrote one of them in Serum and one of them in Diva. And I think they've got very interesting characters and personalities each. And that was the intention to sort of have these different melodic spaces that got taken up. So here's the first one. And that's another one of those arpeggios that can kind of just sit there and have the chord movements beneath it change the whole energy. And I love those kind of arpeggios and synthesizers too, because it's just such like a, it's like that pattern that you can grab onto and it helps guide you through the whole song and you can sort of have this anchor. I feel like sometimes these arpeggios like take the place of a bass line where in a, in a lot of music, like the bass line is the same throughout the whole song. So it's a very easy thing to get your head around and feel. And arpeggios can work the same way and even in shorter sequence. And then I wrote this other melody in opposition of intention from that to live in its own space. And this one felt more like a malady type of melody that reminded me a lot of actually like the xylophone and other mallet played instruments that when I was in high school, I used to play in the percussion ensemble. And I was amazed at what these players could do with a couple mallets and how these blocks would just add this wonderful texture and harmony to the songs. And I think whenever I play something like this, I sort of harken back to those times and try to learn from them again. And I just really liked how this one sat in an entirely different space than the first arpeggio. Continuing on with the making this song feel human theme, the drums, they build up throughout this whole song. And I knew that I didn't want the snare to come in for like a while in this song and have it be something that it's like, oh, finally, like I was wondering what was missing with the drums. And the first part when the snare comes in is the snare is in like halftime. So it's kind of a slower progression and it gives it this really laid back feel. And the fun thing about this snare for this song for me is that this was actually the last thing that I wrote percussively for this song. And I played it basically in one take from the beginning because I knew I wanted it to be used kind of sparingly and sloppily in a way. And I would just start at the beginning and I played the snare through the song after I got the arrangement done. And that's essentially what you hear in the record is me just playing that snare on my push. And I like that turn of changing the snare position from this halftime thing into this double time thing because it, it changes the whole relationship between the kick drum and the snare. And it makes the drums sound way different just by virtue of putting the snare in a faster, more rapid pace. And it was with that change in energy and change in pace that the snare brings. And I wanted to add one more thing to make the song progress and move and change. And it's this last synth bass line that is once again diva. And I wanted something that could be long and short and interplay between 
the legato aspects of the song and the staccato aspects of the song and also be a different energy than the electric bass line that I had in the first half of the track. And so I dialed in just playing around, sort of messing with the same bass line root notes as I had before, but I was playing on my push and always when I'm performing bass lines, especially like on this controller is things end up being a little more punchy and percussive than they would be on a bass uh, just by virtue of how the instrument's laid out. And I liked the differentiation of how I was doing like a bass fill and occupying the space between major changes. And after a little while, I finally sketched out something that I really liked and I landed on this. And there's some pretty cool movement in there with the filter just kind of rolling off the top end and playing with the character of that tone when it's sitting on like a long note versus sitting on something short. And I love like just deep house techno and things like that. So any opportunity I have to throw some of that tonality in there, I'm all in on. And that basically wrapped it up. I got the arrangement done. And this was one of those songs in the album that I thought would be like a filler song. But the more I listen to the record and hear feedback from people is that they like the simplicity and progressive movement of it. And I like that it's maybe gotten to sit in a little higher area of importance within the record. And I hope you enjoy it. This is track five on Past Amore. This song's called Garage. <laughs> 